All right. Uh, today we're starting uh, another discussion on another group of people that are, for a while at least, kind of connected to Egypt. Uh, and these are the ancient Hebrews and uh, the religion that they build up that eventually becomes known as Judaism. Um, and they're a specific community of people who move around all over the area from Egypt all the way up the eastern Mediterranean. And every once in a while they'll try to set up a kingdom and control land um, for many different reasons. They're not really successful at that for the long term. And we'll talk about those uh, today. Uh, one big question to ask, though, uh, right off the bat, is uh, the ancient Hebrews are often described as the first monotheistic society, at, at least that we know of. Uh, almost all the rest of human societies that we're aware of in the ancient world were polytheist. They, had, they s followed religions based on many, many gods, or at least more than one god. That's what polytheism means, poly. Uh, several, more than one. Uh, so monotheism is like a, a strange outlier that kind of pops up. Uh, so the ancient Hebrews will have a belief in one God that created everything. Uh, and they'll be very different from pretty much everyone else in their neighborhood uh, for many, 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 many years. Um, but to us today, monotheism is the basis, the study, the study or the worship of one God is the basis of uh, you know, three or four major religions around the world uh, today. And if you're going up in, say, the United States or Western Europe, uh, you probably have more experience with monotheism than anything else, uh, just kind of statistically. So why is monotheism so important? Uh, and religion in general. Why is it so important to the ancient peoples? That's a giant question to ask right off the bat. Uh, a lot of students have that question when we study ancient history. Uh, why are people so religiously dedicated? Because in our time, uh, religion is a, kind of much less of a focus in people's daily lives. Does that make sense? Well, there's a lot of people individually that still follow it. Um, just like there's probably a few people in the ancient world that were atheists. Uh, they could be punished by government for being that, so they just don't talk about it. Um, but virtually everyone in the ancient world that we know of uh, followed one of these religions or other. So a lot of students today feel kind of disconnect uh, with that kind of perspective. Um, I think the easiest way to explain that is that in the ancient world, and really up until a couple hundred years ago, um, you know, people walk outside their house and they look around. There's this giant mountain right there in their backyard, um, and they ask themselves how that thing got there. And up until a couple hundred years ago, really, God or the gods did it was uh, the only explanation in town. It was kind of the only option if you wanted to try to understand like how there's all these stars in the sky and how everything is the way it is. Does that make sense? Uh, and religion was extremely powerful in virtually everybody's daily life uh, for hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of years, until another alternative comes along uh, in the 1800s, where uh, several scientist-ish type people um, started making arguments that uh, the earth is much older than had previously been assumed. And so a lot of like the big developments, like the mountains or the deserts or these giant rivers, uh, that they basically were kind of built up over eons of time uh, that most humans just have a difficult time understanding because it's such an astronomical amount of time. Um, and that the diversity of life that we see could have, uh, the modern term is evolved uh, from more basic life forms. So when people look around their world and they see that uh, there's people and there's also giraffes and zebras and there's dogs and cats and fish. Uh, where did this diversity come from? In the ancient world, uh, a lot of them said that the gods did it, right? 
And that was uh, the most reliable explanation around for a long, long time until about the 1800s, uh, alternative ideas start to get published and discussed. Does that make sense? So it doesn't mean those alternative ideas are right or that the religious idea is right. It's just now there's another way of thinking about it. This is post-exploration and stuff like that, too. Post-exploration? Yeah. What does that mean? European exploration. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, Europeans are still exploring someplace in the 1800s, but they largely kind of filled in the map, as they say. Uh, there's especially places in Africa in the 1800s in East Asia that they they knew where the coastline was, but they didn't know what was kind of uh, kind of internal inland into the continent, yeah, or the continents. Um, but yeah. So, does that make sense to you? First, the religious argument is the the big one that most people accept until alternatives start to pop up. Yes? Okay. Uh, and, and I think that's why now you have a lot of people that are not as religious as people used to be because now uh, they have a choice. Or at least they kind of feel that they have a choice in explaining just the diversity of life around. Does that make sense? Okay. And also an explanation for all kinds of uh, natural phenomena we see in the world, like this giant rainstorm we just had with all thunder and lightning, uh, there are now more scientific explanations for that stuff, whereas that, that wasn't around before the 1800s. I and mean, even in the 1700s, uh, the leaders of countries, the most powerful people in the world, the kings, when the lightning hit, they hid under their beds. So they thought it was judgment from God, or the gods, or you know, whatever their religious beliefs were. So a lot of the ancient religious movements are based in, uh, especially the polytheisms, many different gods that all control different natural phenomena. Like there's a god of lightning, there's a god of uh, the ocean, there's a god of the flood, there's a god of the springtime and uh, planting season, there's a god of different plants even, god of the harvest, and all kinds of things attached to natural phenomena. Does that make sense? All right. And um, a lot of these societies also build up idea of different gods that are kind of like the judges of human morality that we saw with uh, Osiris in Egypt. <clears throat> will punish you for being bad, basically. Uh, there's also different gods that um, that are like the gods of partying, the gods of like tricking people into kind of doing evil things to other people. So uh, any one religion could have hundreds and hundreds of different gods that all do different kind of jobs in the world. Does that make sense? All right. And we find their icons all over the place, um, all over the world in archaeological sites. Where's that one? Uh, I don't know. I have to look that one up again. That's obviously a god of fertility. At least that's what modern scholars think it is. Uh, yeah, Willendorf. But I'd have to look up that specific meaning. Uh, Willendorf sounds like a German name, maybe a German town. So maybe the icon came from that place, or maybe it's just stored in a museum in in that place. I don't know. Um, I like the image, <laughs> so I used it. But uh, there are many gods and goddesses of fertility, birth rates, basically. Um, Do they also have scriptures? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, the group, the Hebrews we'll talk about, will have their dedicated scriptures. But it appears that every kind of large organized religion wrote their ideas down. Uh, the Egyptians were famous for rugging it on the sides of their buildings. Yeah. They didn't have like a. No. Like a set of like. Oh no, they had books. Oh, yeah, books. they had. Uh, the most famous one is called the Book of the Dead, which is basically a kind of manual for um, when you die, your spirit like wants to get onto that boat and sail off into what we in the West call heaven, basically, right? Um, and it's 
when your spirit realizes the body has died, it has to do this and this and this and this, and eventually it became a very long book because uh, they're very worried about basically your your spirit getting lost on the journey and being uh, just kind of trapped in this world forever. Does that make sense? And then who was like the main writer in these books? Uh, most of those books kind of evolve over time. Like we're talking Egypt over thousands of years. Uh, probably start off as a couple pages of an instruction manual but as more and more fears and possibilities kind of get added to the list you have to have more descriptions about solutions so the book of the dead became very long <laughs> eventually yeah. which is a, a general thing with a lot of religions a lot of them start off with a, a kind of unified idea right and then over the centuries people have questions about it and they add arguments and arguments and eventually they get these books that are thousands of pages long sometimes. Some religions try to avoid that as much as they can by you know, setting the book in place and saying this can never be altered. So, but that runs into problems over time too. If you have a book that can never be altered, then it can never be kind of reinterpreted, right? So some of these movements are believing like the exact words of stuff they believed 2,000 years ago and the world's very different. Does that make sense? I mean, yeah, most, at least, it's estimated that in the next few decades, most people will live in cities, like big metropolis cities. That is the exact opposite in the ancient world. Most people lived out in the countryside. So how can a movement adapt if the, the text has to stay exactly the same over thousands of years? That's a big change in people's daily lives. Does that make sense? Yeah. Question. Would you kind of say at the beginning of the, of the class that like the same problems that we were dealing with like back then, like irrigation and like getting water here and yeah. stuff like that are kind of the same problems? So like doesn't that kind of that can be too, but uh, it's a big difference in I would say, this is just my personal opinion, it's a big difference in uh, living on a ten or twelve acre farm and having a water problem to living in an apartment building with thousands of other people and having a water problem. So that there's a big difference in just daily life and how you approach solving it. Yeah, but what about the interaction of human beings? Is it any different? Uh, I think they are personally, but I think it's just me. Um, yeah, the the basic needs are still kind of the same, like food and water and shelter. Uh, but the way we interact is different. Um, we don't talk to each other as much as society's used to because we have all this online stuff, which I don't really consider talking, it's typing a message and hoping for a response, I guess, and getting a typed message back that you can interpret in many different ways rather than talking to a person in person. Like, have you ever tried to tell a joke online? A lot of times it doesn't work because that inflection and the emotion you have in your face doesn't transcend that, that electronic barrier. So that you're not saying that it's necessarily better, it's just that this is Different. the way that we're going. Well, the way we're going, I, I don't know what way we're going. I'm not very optimistic personally, but uh, I, I just argue it's different. And if you have a text that's exactly the same from a couple thousand years ago with a society that's very different now than it was when the thing was originally written, and if that thing can't change, then that movement can run into problems. Does that make sense? But again, that's just my opinion. It's not the official college statement about these things, and you're not going to be tested on that idea. It's just an idea to throw out there, open for debate, which all ideas are open for debate. Um, oh, well, there's more of the natural based or nature based gods, I guess. Uh, these are particularly from um, ancient Greece. So. The ancient Greeks developed a system of hundreds of different gods, and uh, Poseidon was one of them, one of the more powerful ones, a uh, god of the sea and also of earthquakes. And they try to, like, sometimes develop, like, the super god who has control over all the other gods or loses control every once in a while, and there's, like, a civil war amongst the gods. And if you ever read uh, Greek mythology, that's, that's a lot of... You can spend the rest of your life reading all those stories, I and mean, there's thousands and thousands of them. So just more examples of the nature-based gods. And 
uh, now that we have more kind of scientific explanations for why earthquakes happen, not many people believe in Poseidon much anymore. Does that make sense? I mean, pretty basically. Uh, but I'm sure they're still out there. Or I'm not sure, but I'm, my best guess would be that they're still out there, worshiping Poseidon or Cupid or whatever else. Does that make sense? You have whole holidays for some of these, right? Yeah, that's a, uh, well, at least, that's my complaint of, I've only lived in Los Angeles, really, so that's my complaint about Los Angeles culture. I don't know about the rest of the world or the rest of the country. Um, but yeah, it appears to me that most people just enjoy not having to go to work that day, and so they go to a barbecue or they blow stuff up or they do whatever they do to celebrate when, without really realizing or understanding what they're meant to be celebrating. But people love their barbecues, no? I like barbecues, but... I at least try to spend a few minutes that day thinking about like the reason I have this day off and no? Yeah. My favorite one is the fourth of July, it's my favorite holiday. It's where the, the people rose up and said, We don't need no king, we can govern ourselves, we're all equal. Yeah. But people don't really think about that anymore. It's more where's the barbecue and what are we gonna explode? <laughs> but again, maybe it's just me. All right. Uh, so getting to this particular movement uh, becomes known as Judaism over a long span of time. So again, we're going back thousands of years, even before year zero. Um, the ancient Hebrews were already a community. They were already a group of people amongst hundreds, if not thousands, of other communities, groups of people that are claiming land and trying to build farms and all kinds of stuff around uh, the eastern Mediterranean neighborhood. Uh, they become different from the rest as they develop the belief in one God. So they become one of the first major movements toward monotheism. And they will come to the belief, uh, one way or the other, that there is one God that created everything, created the whole universe, all the stars in the sky, the planet, the mountains, uh, all people and animals, everything. Um, and that... That one God is also the, the judge of all like human behavior. So you get this uh, judgment experience after you die, according to uh, their beliefs. Um, that God will judge you a good person that goes into heaven or a bad person that goes into the other possibility. Um, and they're, again, very different because they're about the only group that believes in just this one creator God that does everything. So there's one God that controls the earthquakes and the lightning and all that other stuff that all these other groups are saying it's many, many different gods that you have to worship. Okay? Uh, and because God created everything according to their beliefs, they believe that God is outside of what we call material existence. God is not physical. All right? God created the physical, so God has to be more powerful than all the physical stuff that you see. Does that make sense? This would be like saying if you break out a lump of Play-Doh and you make a little figure or a little table or whatever, you are more powerful than that thing because you built it. Does that make sense? You made it. Creation. Yeah. So you influenced it. That means you're stronger than what you have created. So they say that God is completely outside of material existence. Right? They say you don't find God in a building or a statue or any physical object. It's, it's not possible. Does that make sense? God is beyond that. And really so beyond it um, that God, if God is not material, God is not subject, does not have to follow the laws of matter, material. So God does not have to follow the kind of physical laws of the universe, like gravity. God made gravity, so why would God have to follow gravity? Does that make sense? So they believe that um, no natural event, no hurricane, no flood, 
nothing that you can physically see, touch, hear, anything like that, that will never reveal God to you. God is beyond that, beyond the physical realm. Does that make sense? All right. And they come to believe that God chose to reveal himself to their community. And not even their whole community, just to one guy. Because if God is beyond the material realm, um, and we live in the material realm, then how do you know God exists, basically? So in order to prove his existence, or its existence, God revealed itself to one person and gave that person a message to convince all the rest of the people that God exists. So Hebrews would be uh, like a religious figure? No, uh, Hebrew is just a name for the group, the big community, which is... By this point, thousands and thousands of people. It's a, it's a large group. Um, so the Hebrews, they never claim to know why God did this, why God chose them. Even today, they don't claim to know that. That's a mystery to them. And they even pretty say so, obvious, or honestly, and upfront. Um, they just say, God revealed himself to our leader, our founder, and uh, gave us the mission of basically spreading the message to the rest of humankind. The message of one creator, God. Monotheism. Um, and they, they say this happened. We, we don't know why God chose us specifically, but that's the way it went. So uh, that's how they uh, continue to interpret it. They call themselves uh, God's chosen people very often. So you might hear that in political statements or something. All right. Um, and the guy that God chose is named Abraham. And according to their belief structure, their belief system, um, God chose Abraham and gave Abraham this message, revealed himself or itself to Abraham and made a deal with Abraham. And the deal is Abraham will become, quote, the leader of a great nation. As long as Abraham and this community runs itself according to basically justice and humanity. As long as their central kind of treatment of each other is good, is moral. They, they're supposed to you know, treat each other as brothers and neighborly and all that kind of stuff. They're not supposed to steal from each other or other people or harm each other or do any of the kind of immoral, unethical stuff. So that's the deal. Abraham will be a, a great leader of a powerful nation and as long as they continue governing based on those principles. Does that make sense? And that deal comes to be known as the covenant. It's up there. There, there it is. That's the official term, the official word for this. It's not really a contract. It's like a handshake kind of deal. It's an agreement. And Abraham kind of spreads his message and people start to follow him and he gains leadership of this community and they start writing down a lot of their beliefs um, into basically what becomes known as the Old Testament today. Um, and uh, it's been studied by scholars in pretty extreme detail and uh, a lot of the stories in the Old Testament seem very similar to uh, other religious stories uh, myths that are kind of floating around the neighborhood at the time. 
Uh, that's one group of people thought that they were so smart they're going to build a, a giant tower and all the way up into the cloud so they can like access God. Does that sound familiar? Oh, yeah, and that there's this mythical early garden where all life started, and then there was a flood that wiped off, wiped out all life. So a lot of those stories are already circulating, circulating around all these different communities that the Hebrews are just one group within. Um, but they start writing down the stories and all those become kind of codified into what we today call the Old Testament. Does it make sense? Okay. And uh, a lot because Abraham is talking about being the leader of a great nation, a lot of them start to define that as uh, they're going to become a powerful kind of kingdom, a political group with an army, and they have, they're going to have land. So they start uh, kind of moving around all over the place looking for a good place to you know, start their, their kingdom. Um, and the problem is that they don't really have a whole lot of people compared to these other groups that surround them. So they'll go to one place and try to kind of take over that territory and uh, you know, set up their government. Uh, but neighboring groups will kick them out because they have more soldiers. Does that make sense? And this, uh, the Bible calls it this kind of period of wandering under Abraham. And this goes on for so long, it goes on for decades and decades and decades that Abraham actually gets old and dies. And so the so-called descendants of Abraham is a uh, kind of family down to the generations take up leadership of this community and continue looking, looking around for a place to set up shop, basically. Does that make sense? This goes on for many, many years, reportedly until they are given what is known as the land of Goshen uh, in the Old Testament. And that <coughs> is, historians describe that as an area near the Sinai Peninsula, which is this giant desert, really. Uh, the land of Goshen is reportedly between the eastern part of the Nile Delta before you get into the giant desert. Does that make sense? So kind of on the eastern periphery of Egypt. And uh, historians today believe that this seems to have been a political deal between the Egyptian government at the time and this wandering group of hero Hebrews. Uh, basically the deal seems to be that the Egyptian government is having problems problem controlling this eastern territory of theirs. And so they bring in a foreign community and set them up there and say, you can run this little territory. Uh, you can make your your own laws, as long as they kind of agree with a lot of Egyptian laws, basic idea of Egyptian law. Uh, you can run your own community and just keep control of the place for us. Does that make sense? No? Was it like a good area? Like where they can get food and stuff? No, it's no. on the edge of the desert, so it's not easy to grow food there. But, but what was so special about that area that they ended up there? It's the best opportunity they got. They've tried taking over other more valuable places and they keep getting kicked out. They keep getting attacked. Uh, so the Hebrew leadership accepts this and they move on in. And they set up their community there. And uh, they reportedly stay there for several generations. Uh, over time though, according to the, the statements we have from Hebrews like in their community, on, they start to kind of think of themselves as oppressed by the Egyptians. Like the Egyptians uh, try to run this place with a kind of increasingly heavy hand. And uh, some of the Hebrews start describing themselves as slaves to the Egyptian government. Um, and so a whole kind of uh, language of the, all the Hebrews are slaves to the Egyptians kind of gets built up. And uh, it's often misinterpreted as like, the Hebrews are real legalized kind of slaves that the Egyptian government controls, which doesn't seem to be true, but that's what happens when you start talking in that way. Does that make sense? And if you write it down and other people find that stuff a long time later and don't know how to interpret it or misinterpret it. Um, so they are in Egypt for many generations, lifetimes of individuals, until eventually they get sick of it and they want to leave Egypt because they feel they're so oppressed. And by this time, their political leader is named Moses. 
and he has, seems to have some kind of like personal contact with the Pharaoh. Uh, so Moses reportedly tries to negotiate uh, kind of the end of the deal where the Hebrews say we don't want to stay here anymore we're going to move out and you can have the land back but apparently they were so valuable to the Egyptians that the Egyptian government didn't want to let them go and the Pharaoh threatened uh, to send in the Egyptian army and force them to stay which you know, Hebrews obviously didn't like uh, so Moses, uh, kind of in a very daring move, uh, tells them to pack up one night and they try to leave in the middle of the night and just run away to escape. Um, and there's a kind of famous story uh, about that escape where, go back to the map, uh, go back to the map over here. Uh, where the Egyptian or the, the Hebrews get away from the Egyptian government, and as they're running away, they run into some part of the Red Sea. So they run up against the coastline, and there's this giant body of water. They don't have boats, so they're they're stuck, and they feel that they're going to be trapped. And the Egyptian army is kind of chasing them, and the Egyptians going to kill them all. Uh, so the story goes that Moses uh, asks for he starts praying and asks for God's help to save them. And uh, he walks out into, uh, kind of waist deep into the water, and uh, puts his walking stick, his staff, into the water. Um, and at that point, God intervenes and separates the water, pulls the water into two different directions, and opens a path along the, the land so that the Hebrews can walk across to the other side with the water being held up. Does that make sense? You've heard of this before? Uh, part of the Red Sea. Yeah. Um, what, do the Egyptian, what does the Egyptian army do? Yeah, they take the risk of trying to follow them to, to capture the Hebrews. And the story says that once the Egyptian army uh, got be into the area where the water was, I God let the water go and drown them all. Um, so there, that's the, the famous story of the so-called parting of the Red Sea. Um, some historians are reanalyzing those original documents uh, and trying, or some are trying to reinterpret uh, the so called parting of the Red Sea. Uh, some have argued that uh, the original texts that tell this story actually say that the, the so called Red Sea was actually a, a marsh called the Sea of Reeds. So it just may have been mistranslated, uh, which could have been a much smaller waterway and could have all kinds of alternative explanations for the parting and the drowning and all this kind of stuff. But it's something that historians are still debating today, whether this actually happened. And how can you prove whether, how can you prove if it happened, or how can you prove it didn't happen? So there's research still being done on this stuff. And again, that's the kind of stuff that, questions that historians ask, and try to look for evidence to prove an answer one way or the other. Um, but we are pretty certain that the Hebrews do get out of Egypt, uh, and we think that they go back up into the kind of eastern Mediterranean coastline area. Um, that whole movement out of Egypt is called the Exodus, and that starts a whole new several generations of wandering around looking for a good land to build their community again, to start a kingdom and build farms and you know, get themselves off the ground. And reportedly, that goes for another several generations. So uh, most of Hebrew history is really moving from one place to another, trying to find some amount of security and stability. And again, it's, it's the same story as before when they were in Egypt. They find a good place, and they try to occupy it and control it, and they get attacked, and they get kicked out. And this goes on for sometimes hundreds of years. So it's a long, long history of it. Does that make sense? Yes? No? I don't know. Questions about that? Is there another way they could have gotten to where they had the Red Sea not been parted? Where they ended up besides the Red Sea? Besides the Red sea? I haven't read the scholarship on this stuff in a good 10 years, so I just I haven't kept up with it. I'm, researching other stuff, so I 
I know what the historians are saying 10 years ago, but that could have changed pretty dramatically by now. So I don't even want to try to guess an answer at that one. But uh, 10 years ago, they were talking about the possibility that um, if it was just a kind of marsh, kind of swampish kind of area, maybe uh, Moses knew the, the area well enough to know when the, there was going to be a low tide. Do you guys know what that is at the beach? Where it opens more land for you to travel through, and he knew exactly when the high tide was going to come in, so he timed it to move his people through right before the high tide came in, knowing the Egyptians going to follow him. High tide comes in and drowns him. So he could have been a, just a very smart kind of a geographer and military leader. But I don't know what's happened with those arguments. I just haven't kept up with it. Question? What was the main reason the Egyptians wanted them to stay? Uh, number one, they're guarding a place for Egypt. Um, Egypt wanted to keep control of it, or the government apparently wanted to keep control of that area, but they didn't have the manpower to actually do it themselves. So they hire someone else. It's like hiring a security guard. You don't want to be there all the time, so you hire someone else to watch the place for a long time. Um, you could also get into uh, just government pride. I mean, Egypt, they make these deals with other groups all over the place. So if you let one go, what happens when the next one complains? Does that make sense? Do you give in to their demands too? What happens when the next one? Your whole empire can fall apart. A uh, similar argument to uh, like, why is the United States still have troops in Afghanistan? Why keep fighting? It's been 15 years. Uh, what's the government say? What, what do the government leaders say about that? They want to uprise. Yeah. If we pull our troops out, then that'll send a message to our enemy that all they have to do is wait us out, and eventually we're going to leave, and then they can just take the place over again. So it's a kind of danger of setting an example. Does that make sense? So there were other groups that they oppressed that way to keep them in place or in their yeah, place? Yeah, this, this is empire. Uh, this is, this is. do you know anything about the history of like United States relations with Haiti or Cuba or uh, virtually all of Latin America? Uh, it's, it's an ugly history. And a lot of it is just based in empire, just wanting to control other places and you make deals with their leaderships and they'll agree to oppress their own people if they're getting paid to do it history of Iran in the modern world it's and it's not just the United States it's countries all over the world doing this uh, for all of human history that we really know about ever since they started making cities so yeah um, so it's not just Egypt and it's not just the Hebrews so it's and it keeps happening uh, but the Hebrews were successful uh, well if that's what you define as success yeah uh, there's different ways of defining success. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. They escaped, but now they have to look for another good or a good piece of land, and they're not very successful at that. At least according to my definition, they have to keep moving around because they keep getting attacked. So uh, it's up to each person to define what their idea of a success and failure is, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I I've had students before who say. Uh, um, they took a test that had 30 questions on them. They got mad because they got one question wrong. I'm like, well, I think that's pretty successful, but to them it wasn't good enough. Does that make sense? And I'm sure there's some people out here right now. Uh, they really want their A. Some people are happy with the C. Have you guys taken a statistics class yet? You have that enjoyment in your future. Um, when I took statistics, I was happy with the C. I just wanted to pass the thing. <laughs> I just wanted to survive. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's it's all in, what do they say? It's all in the, the mind of the beholder, something like that. Uh, okay. Well, well, they're wandering around for a long time. Let's see. Uh, eventually, um, they come to settle in this area uh, between the Jordan River, which is this big waterway here, right in the middle, uh, uh, amongst these mountains. Uh, so they settle in an area between uh, the river itself and between the coastline. So on the kind of western 
part of the river, but not on the river itself, because more powerful groups own that land because it's really good farmland. It's right next to the river. Uh, so they can't get control of uh, kind of riverfront property, basically. So they have to uh, set their community, this is the best they could get, was in the more mountainous kind of area um, further away from the river, but before you get to the coastline. Because other powerful groups control the coastline because that's a center of trade. You can get boats in and out. So that's a place of prosperity and power. Does that make sense? And uh, why the mountains? Protection. Yeah, you can protect yourself because enemies have a tough time attacking you when you're in the mountains. So that's a good thing for having land in the mountains. There's also a major downside. What are most mountains made out of? Rock. They have big rocks in there. So uh, it's really difficult to farm that land because it's so rocky. It's hard to grow a lot of a big food supply, basically. Uh, so some historians interpret this as this was the worst land they could possibly get a hold of, and that's why they got it. Because they're not really well organized. They don't have a very big army to defend it. Uh, so they go for a place that no one else really wants. Does that make sense? Okay. But this is where they're going to start building their, eventually, kingdom. Uh, for a long time, they, uh, through all this period of wandering, uh, they never really had a king. Uh, they seemed to be very worried about that. Uh, they just had dealings with the pharaoh, who was kind of absolute leader of Egypt. Uh, they felt oppressed. So uh, much like the kind of American revolutionaries, after they overthrow a king, they don't want to set up a new one because they know what problems that can cause. Does that make sense? They're very worried about tyranny. So for a long time, they, they're very hesitant to build a real centralized uh, political power. But over time, as they continue being attacked even for that land, they decide to make a monarchy and centralize government so that they could have you know, a central decision maker who could build up an army and lead wars and you know, defend their community. Does that make sense? So they eventually give in to that, what they view as just necessary for their own survival. And a uh, few of the most important kings that will eventually rise in what becomes called the Kingdom of Israel. A um, couple of the most important ones are Saul and then David. Uh, Saul was king. He was leader of the government, the monarchy. Uh, his family was the royal family. And uh, Saul declares war and builds armies and tries to defend their territory and even try to gain more territory, so Saul's armies often attack their neighbors and try to gain more land, which is normal in the ancient world. Um, and in one of these wars, uh, the Hebrew army goes out to fight, and they go up against their one of their neighbors, basically. And, uh, you know, sometimes armies, they usually, they send their leaders or their messengers uh, to a kind of meeting place and they, they negotiate whether or not they're going to fight that day and uh, all kinds of things about the battle that's supposed to happen. Sometimes they decide not to have a battle at all that day. Um, and in those instances, uh, instead of both armies fighting each other totally, completely, uh, each side wants to kind of go back home and claim that they won the battle. But you can't have both sides doing that because no one's going to believe it. Uh, so what they'll often do to kind of decide who can formally declare that they won, each army will pick one soldier and send the, these two guys out to the middle and they'll fight it out and whichever of those two guys wins the, the individual fight, uh, then that army gets to go home and proclaim victory. Does that make sense? Um, so the, the Hebrew enemy, the neighbor, they pick their normal guy. They, they're going to have a battle. They decide not to fight. So the enemy picks their like normal guy, which is reportedly this guy's like eight feet tall. He's like 300 pounds of pure muscle. He's an expert like UFC kind of fighter, right? <laughs> and none of the Hebrew soldiers want to go fight that guy because whoever goes out there to fight him is going to get killed. 
So they pick this kind of skinny guy named David, and they say, okay, you try to go out there and fight him. I don't want to do it. Send, send someone else out there is like a sacrificial lamb, basically. <laughs> uh, so this guy named David gets picked, and he doesn't like it. Uh, he's very afraid of this enemy soldier named Goliath. Uh, so David figures out a smart way of fighting, which is basically stay away from that guy. Um, David has a little sling, and he picks up a big rock, um, and not really a, a kind of slingshot like you see in like children's cartoons or something. Uh, the sling is like a, a big sleeve, basically, where he puts the rock in one end and he kind of winds it up and throws the rock. And uh, he throws the rock, and it hits Goliath reportedly right between the eyes and kills him. And that's the story of David slaying Goliath without having to get too close to the guy. Does that make sense? And the Hebrew soldiers think this is funny as hell. And they all laugh at it, and they start throwing parties in David's honor because he's so smart, and now they get to brag about winning the, the victory in the first place. So uh, the Hebrew army goes back home, and they start spreading this story because it's hilarious. And David becomes a celebrity. So he's invited to banquets and parties, and he tells a story over and over again. So he becomes like a well-known person within his kingdom. Does that make sense? And as sometimes happens with celebrities, uh, you know, he's a soldier in the army. So the rulers, King Saul, promotes him. It says, this average soldier was so great, did such a great thing for our people, uh, promotes him way up the ranks of the army. And basically makes uh, David one of the king's uh, personal bodyguards. He carries the king's weapons in battle. So if the king goes into battle and he wants his sword, David hands him the sword. Does that make sense? So it's a big kind of honorable uh, official position. Um, and David uses that kind of notoriety um, to basically build up his own little political party. Built up a lot of supporters who really like David. And David's trying to launch a political career based on this celebrity. Sound familiar? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, this scares Saul very badly. David is really popular. So Saul becomes afraid that someday David, who is obviously very ambitious, is going to try to overthrow Saul and take the throne for himself. Does that make sense? Uh, so Saul tries to tell David, you know, calm down, don't be taking all these steps, uh, you have to stop all this. And David keeps doing it, so Saul fires him. And even kicks him out of the kingdom. Bans him from Israel. And that really pisses David off. Uh, so David now is really motivated to try to overthrow Saul. To at least save his own reputation. Does that make sense? So David goes to some of Israel's neighbors that are at war with Israel and offers a deal if you give me money and weapons and soldiers, I'll sneak them in to Israel, overthrow Saul, make myself king, and then we will have good relations with Israel in your country. Does that make sense? So he makes a deal saying, I'll do what you want if you help me get to the throne. Which could involve exchanging lands or all kinds of things. Uh, the neighbors don't trust David. So they don't give him a whole army. They give him a few soldiers and a few weapons and a little bit of money. And they tell him, to prove that we can trust you, take these, this small contingent of soldiers and go off and attack the borders of Israel. Attack your own people, your own cities. And steal from them and bring all the treasure back to us. And he actually does it. He launches raids on his own people to prove how reliable he is to his uh, funders, basically, his backers. Does that make sense? No? This would be like whoever doesn't win the presidential election uh, goes to Canada and tells Canada, 
why don't you give me a, a huge army and a bunch of money, and I'll sneak them into the United States, I'll overthrow the U.S. government, make myself king of the United States, and I'll give Canada what you want. Does that make sense? So, I mean, this is pretty clear, treason. And if he gets caught, he'll be executed. If Saul catches him doing it, he'll get executed. Uh, but eventually, he, his raids on, the, on his own people's settlements are very successful, and uh, the neighbors trust him now, so they give him a full-fledged army. He invades Israel and overthrows Saul, has Saul executed, and Saul's whole family, all the way down to the grandchildren, which in some instances are five or six years old, has them all crucified uh, to wipe out the whole government, basically, and uh, make himself into the new king. And he does it. So now David is king of Israel. Does that make sense? Um, how does David justify this? He's now king of the, you know, king of Israel, king of the people, basically. Um, how does he convince them to support this, or to at least accept it? What does he say to him? I just did this for my own enrichment and, and to make myself such a powerful person? Is that going to get people's support? I did this for me? No. So what does he tell them? He did it for the people. God. Not, yeah, not just that he did it for the people. He says, well, I'm going to govern well, and so you're going you're gonna to benefit from this. But he said, God came to me and told me to do it. This all has God's permission. I'm doing God's work. And uh, either the people believe this, or they're so afraid of him that they just kind of accepted it. Uh, but David is a hardcore dictator. And he punishes people who speak out against him. Does that make sense? And I'm not aware of really any very reliable historians that agree with or disagree with that uh, basic story I just told you. All right? It's pretty well accepted by a consensus of leading historians, or at least used to be a few years ago. Uh, so a question about David's rise at all? Does that make sense? Who killed him? Uh, that's a good question. Well, how does he die, number one? Okay. Uh, is there a revolution against him? There's, a, there's an, a few attempts at uprising. None of them succeed, and he crushes them and, and punishes their leaders, usually with execution. Uh, so how does David die? Does anyone know? Uh, the Bible reports that he died peacefully in his sleep one day. Royal. Yep. So the, the major kind of source of reporting on this says that uh, he basically grew old and was never punished for his actions. <laughs> he remained king till the day he died. And sometimes that happens with dictators and dictatorships. Sometimes they stay in power, right? Does that make sense? And still all over the world today. And a lot of them still justifying it by saying that, you know, God or the gods or whatever religion that, they're, that they believe in, um, God wants me in this position to lead the people, and so here I am. And anyone who disagrees with me is complaining about God's choice. It's still an idea out there in the world. You've heard of this? Yeah, there's still monarchies out there. Um, but the interesting, one of the other interesting things about David, he doesn't just stop there. Uh, he is extremely ambitious. He wants to build up the size of Israel. So they kind of start off, uh, by the time David got to the throne, uh, they own a lot of coastline also. Uh, but he also starts launching massive foreign invasions um, to conquer the whole area around the Jordan River. And he builds up a gigantic army to do this, and he drafts a lot of soldiers. Uh, so he launches invasions first south and conquers all the way down into the one on this map. It's called Edom, uh, down here at the bottom, E-D-O-M. It's kind of yellowish area. And he's not even content with owning the kind of western side of the river uh, then he sends his troops, kind of turns around and sends them north, up the other end, up the east coast of the river, and conquers another series of kingdoms. Um, and 
conquers a gigantic amount of territory compared to what he uh, inherited or took from the overthrown government in the first place. So he's massively successful militarily. And like most military invasions, they're successful usually on the sort of brutality. <laughs> Um, they wipe out their enemies or they intimidate their enemies to the point where they just give up. So some of David's invasions are what we would today call genocidal. Wipe out the whole uh, men, women, and children of the enemy communities. Uh, the biggest problem he had with all these invasions is the capital city of Ammon, which on here is this kind of bluish area to the east, uh, the city called Rabah, uh, that was the capital city, and he realized that he could only conquer that whole kingdom if he got control of the city. And the people in the city uh, refused to surrender. So he does a military strategy that's called laying siege, which means his army surrounded the whole city and uh, didn't let any food or supplies or anything in. And basically waited for the people in the city to either surrender or starve to death. So it's called the Siege of Rabah, and it went on for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. And uh, David eventually got so sick of it that uh, he returned home to the capital city in Israel, to his, uh, his own palace, and uh, reportedly got very interested in this lady he met named Bathsheba, and uh, reportedly seduced her and impregnated her and then learned that she was married to one of his soldiers at the siege of Rabah. So he realizes that's going to be a problem because if that gets out into the public that he is uh, you know, destroying the marriage of one of his loyal soldiers on the front line of the war, um, you know, people might rise up against him in Israel itself. Uh, so he comes up with a pretty inventive solution. Uh, he issues orders, or has the generals issue orders to uh, put that soldier on what we today call on leave, which means you can go back home and relax, right? So that he'll go and spend some time with his wife, and in a few weeks when it is obvious that she's pregnant, everyone will think that, you know, the husband did it. Does that make sense? Um... The soldier, though, says, no, I will not leave my brothers in arms. I will stay at the siege. Uh, so he's like super loyal. So what does David do then? Puts him on the front line. Yep, puts him on the front line of the next battlefield, which all the front line soldiers are almost always killed. <laughs> and that soldier is killed on the battlefield. Um, and reportedly... Uh, I think David made that Sheba like one of his wives or something after that, now that she's newly single. <laughs> so, uh, you know, historians mostly have a pretty negative view of David. <laughs> they view him as greedy, ambitious, and willing to really harm and kill a lot of people to get what he wants. Does that make sense? He's willing to destroy his enemies or anyone who just, uh, according to what other circumstances arise, or might be a problem for him in the future. So he's often viewed as a pretty uh, merciless politician, which is often very different from uh, other stories you hear about David. Does that make sense? So David has a pretty long and interesting career, and we've only talked about him for a few minutes. And again, there's a lot of scholarship on David. And uh, he is one of the major kind of builders of uh, the ancient kingdom of Israel. Um, which uh, eventually separates into two different kingdoms, a northern kingdom after he's long gone, like hundreds of years after he's gone. Uh, so there'll be a northern kingdom called Israel and then a southern kind of like brother kingdom, cooperative government called Judah. Does that make sense? All uh, right, uh, let's see, moving on from there. Uh, and long, long after, I mean, hundreds of years after David, um, these two kingdoms face invasion, and they're actually conquered in two separate instances. 
so the Assyrians invade, we think from, I think it's the north, and invade Israel and conquer it in 721 BC, so 721 years before zero. So Israel doesn't exist anymore after that invasion. And then another group called the Chaldeans, uh, if I remember right, we think they came from the east and attacked Judah and uh, conquered Judah and uh, didn't really wipe out the Hebrews in those two kingdoms in either of these invasions, um, but kind of pushed them out of the territory, forced them to go somewhere else. And that becomes known as another, the next kind of long, hundreds long year period of uh, what I think is the Bible calls this the exile, that they had their territory, now they're kicked out, so they're exiled from their own homeland. Which is a kind of interesting interpretation. They only had that for a few hundred years, um, whereas they you know, had these periods of wandering that last much longer than they had those kingdoms for. So even after David built up this giant kingdom and this very powerful army, they're eventually attacked and, and pushed out. So they are wandering again. And the next step is that actually just a few decades, uh, you know, skipping past decades in a class like this goes really fast. Uh, just a few decades after the Chaldeans uh, push them out of Judah, then the Chaldeans are conquered by an even larger entity called the Persian Empire, which will eventually conquer all this stuff in these kind of purple lines. And when the Persians come through and they defeat the Chaldeans, uh, the Persians want to control that area, but they feel they don't have enough soldiers to really control it, so they invite the Hebrews back in and they make a deal with the Hebrews saying basically you can have your kingdom back you can even call it Judah or Israel or whatever you want to call it and you can make your own local laws and you know govern however you want as long as you realize you're just one small piece of the whole Persian Empire and that you follow orders from us when we make certain demands usually with like taxes and how many soldiers you get from the area and that kind of stuff So the Hebrews come back and they rebuild the government, but they're not independent. They're one small province within a much larger empire. Uh, a lot like, say, I don't know, California or Arizona. Uh, it's a fairly large territory, but it is subsumed by a larger entity. Does that make sense? So it's like one state within the United States. Is that clear? Okay. So they're under Persian rule. Yep. And, uh, you know, they can, they can govern themselves according to their own culture as long as they're not breaking the larger, higher-up Persian laws. And the Persians don't really care how the area is being run, uh, um, at least in that territory, because they've got uh, bigger problems going on to take care of. Uh, so with all this wandering and not really having control of territory for like most of their history, the overwhelming amount of their history, um, a lot of historians uh, try to figure out how is it that this community stayed together? Why don't they just kind of split up and people go all over the place trying to seek whatever is best for themselves and their own family? Um, how do these people stay in a unified community? And the two things that historians have mostly uh, observed is that the Hebrews identify themselves according to their religious beliefs, monotheism, belief in one God, amongst uh, many other cultures that are almost all polytheistic. So that makes them different from virtually everybody else in their area. And uh, they define themselves according to that belief rather than where they're living because they're moving all over the place for a long time. 
and uh, their central kind of core ideas about law and morality are all in this one document called the Torah, which they come to believe is given to them by God. Uh, this is not something that humans wrote down. This is created, that God created this and handed it to them. So that's the core of their, their self-image, basically. The way they think of themselves, the way they see themselves. Questions about that at all? <coughs> and uh, that'll continue being so because uh, they'll keep moving around, uh, really, for uh, right up until this last century. Uh, they move into Europe, they, they spread out all over the place, and uh, their communities try to keep that core identity, though. So, in a lot of ways, um, at least certain kind of facets of Judaism become extremely conservative. They don't want to change it.